Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mike Schweitz. Mike is uh, with Arthritis and Rheumatology Associates of Palm Beach. Uh, he's uh, currently president of the Coalition of State Rheumatology Organizations. Uh, Mike's a native of Washington, D.C. He received his uh, bachelor's degree, medical degree, was an intern and resident, and a rheumatology fellow at George Washington University. He's past president of the Florida Society of Rheumatology. He's chief of the Division of Rheumatology at Good Samaritan Hospital. And he's uh, been on the CORC Committee for the ACR, and he's president of CSRO. And this morning, he's going to tell us about RAC. Um, it's a privilege to be here, and it's uh, sad that I have to be here, uh, because unfortunately, I'm one of the few folks around the country who've had intimate experience uh, with RAC that I'm going to share with you today. Um, I'm going to share some of our insights and some of our suggestions to you about how to deal with the rack going forward. Are you prepared for the rack? Before we talk about the rack, we're going to talk a little bit about what's been in place for a number of years to look at what we do. And we are being watched all the time by uh, CMS and, for that matter, the other payers as well, which we'll talk about. And we're looked at in a variety of ways. Probe audits, which are audits looking at specific issues in our reimbursement, in our, in our uh, billing. <coughs> These audits of any sort can actually result in some nasty little things. And I think um, Joe Huffstadter touched on them yesterday in his discussion of what happened in the audit he participated in. Uh, a statistically valid random sampling is, is a word, those words you don't want to hear. Those words mean that they have looked at X number of your charts and they have extrapolated a number based on all the other codes that you have billed that they were examining and they come up with an extrapolated number. So if they find errors in 60% of the charts they reviewed, they may ask you for 60% 60, 60 of all the monies due on all the charts on all those codes for the year. And it can result in some very large numbers as Joe pointed out. Prepayment review is also something that you really don't want to have <coughs> come your way. And that means that every time you submit a claim for whatever, whatever it is they've audited, they will re review your chart before they pay you, which will result in tremendous delays in your reimbursements. Uh, there are also uh, organizations called Program Safeguard Contractors. Well, they used to be called that. Now they're called ZIPICs or Zone, zone uh, protection integrity contractors, and they are um, organizations that are actually looking more for fraud and abuse. We're going to talk about the, the post-payment review organization called the RAC, but before we do, we'll talk a little bit about the CERT. How many of you have gotten a CERT letter? They're very common. The CERT is a, uh, or is a program through CMS that was dis the, which was developed from congressional legislation looking to reduce errors in reimbursement by Medicare. In 1996, Medicare had an er estimated error rate of 14%. 14% of all claims were paid in error, either up or down, but mostly, of course, up. Uh, this CERT was established to monitor Medicare. It's there to, medic to, to monitor the Medicare carrier. They randomly choose X number of charts yearly I think last year it was 130,000 claims, not charts, but claims. And they will send the provider a letter asking for your records to review whether that claim was paid properly. It really doesn't have much to do with you. It has to do with the program, and it is trying to reduce the error rate. In 2007, uh, the error rate, in 2008, the error rate was reduced down to 3.7%, which is not really too bad for a $276 billion business. Uh, most of those 90% were overpayments. And that brings us to what triggers audits. These are some general things that trigger audits at all levels with all insurance companies. I'm sure most of you could probably recite them to me. Obviously, inconsistent coding within a group, uh, high levels of E&M services on a consistent basis, 
If every one of your OA of the knee patients is coded with a level five or four for that matter, it's gonna bring attention, unbundling services. Improper use of modifiers is very common and probably the granddaddy of them all is inadequate documentation. And most of us err, I think, not so much from overcoding, but from under documentation. Uh, and getting someone in your office to help you learn the ins and outs of documentation is very valuable. We'll talk about that as well. And lastly, something that most of us don't think much about, but whistleblowers. And they can come from patients who are angry with you and call Medicare and say, I got the EOB and it says he gave me a knee injection and he didn't. Uh, those types of things. Staffers, people in your office, employees who uh, may see something that they think is, is being done uh, under the table or in an, in an insufficient way and call Medicare and hope to see big dollars in getting a percentage of what Medicare recoups. And other providers can also be sources of complaints. So be aware of all these things in your daily activities. Why is the government interested? Uh, they've spent a um, billion dollars a year from physical year in 2003, and they, for every dollar they spend, they recoup $18. So they've got a lot of incentive, a lot of incentive to look at uh, recouping money and errors in reimbursement. Today we're gonna to talk about the RAC in some detail. We're gonna talk about its genesis and purpose, uh, the purpose of its mission. We'll see what methods they use. We'll talk at some length about uh, my experience in the demonstration project and the experience of Florida physicians. Congressional oversight, which resulted in some changes, uh, which we, we had some part in. How the RAC has expanded. And lastly, we'll have some advice on how to deal with the RAC. We'll talk about who and what they are, why they do it, what's happened, and what strategies to consider. This would be us. Uh, and the rest, of course, is the RAC, and I think you can add a lot of other organizations that are yanking on us. The, act, the RAC was established uh, by the Medicare Modernization Act 2003, primarily as a three-year demonstration project, which ran from uh, 06, 07, and 08. In 2006, the Tax Relief and Healthcare Act uh, formalized and made it permanent uh, to be implemented by CMS no later than 2010, and the RAC is now fully operational throughout the country, starting last year and culminating in this year through four, four zones, which we will discuss. This was something that we, were, we tried to get changed, and we haven't been able to, but we'll talk about this at length, but both of these laws give CMS the authority to do something they've never done, and that's pay the RAC companies on a contingency basis. So they get a percentage of whatever they can collect, and if that isn't an, a nasty incentive, I don't know what is. Uh, as I said, it was a three-year demonstration project. This 200 million is an error. Uh, it's more like uh, five or 600 million. Uh, the three states that were chosen for the demonstration project were Florida, New York, and California. Uh, they were chosen because the three, those three states have 25% of all Medicare claims. Uh, obviously, they have a large population of retired people. Uh, they also have higher per capita Medicare expenses than other states in the union. The companies that were chosen were PRG Schultz, Health Data Insights, which we dealt, dealt with in Florida, a nasty group of people, I might add, and Connolly Consulting. These companies are expert in mining data uh, from computers, and that's how they operate. And their methods and how they go about it are totally non-transparent and totally proprietary. So there's no way of knowing exactly how they do what they do or why they do it. The mission of the RAC was to detect and correct past improper, this is language, by the way, from CMS, uh, correct and past improper payments so that CMS, the carriers, fiscal intermediaries, and Medicare uh, administrative contractors can implement actions that will prevent future improper payments, and they're so nice to us that they want to make sure we can avoid so, so many claims that do not comply with the rules. They want to lower its error rate, and they, this is certainly a, a noble endeavor for sure to make sure that the Medicare beneficiaries, which include us, are protected in the future. Well, they look at all kinds of improper payments. They look for services that are not necessary, and this is one of the real 
problems with the system is that these, a lot of times, there's a disagreement on what is and what isn't medically necessary. 